Well, good morning and welcome to each of you. It's good to see you out on this beautiful Lord's Day. We're going to begin with singing a congregational song, number 17. And we do invite you, if you will, if you're able, want to stand while we sing. We'll sing the first and last verse of number 17. in prayer, please. Amen. Please be seated. Well, again, it's uh, good to see each of you. We welcome you. Our choir does have a musical to sing. We're not trained professionals. We're not performers. We're just a handful of people saved by God's grace who want to bring glory to him. And so uh, <clears throat> when I mess up, that's not going to ruin my career, okay, because my career is not a professional singer. So we hope that uh, you'll be blessed by the message of it, and uh, it has a question as the title of it, and so we'll deal with that question throughout not only the song, but also the uh, message that'll follow.
perfection that was destroyed, of mercy that was extended, and of God's faithfulness through it all. Despite humanity's rebellion and disobedience, God's plan to set things right kept unfolding. There were times the Almighty's voice thundered with judgment. Sometimes it was a song of comfort. For 400 years, he was simply silent. Then one night, in the town of Bethlehem, everything changed.
just when it looked like the story of Jesus would end in defeat, heaven revealed a new chapter called victory. Sometime before the third day dawned within the tomb, his heart began to beat. His lungs filled with air. Jesus rose to life again, just as he said he would. And the sorrow of the cross turned into joy.
tell him again and again that he is more than we he imagined we could be. And we want to tell the world they will never find anyone who is like our Lord.
going to ask you to get on your feet and sing number 479, just a couple verses, and give the choir time to get back to their chairs. 479, and we'll sing the first and last verse. <laughs>
I want to thank our choir, their troopers. They work hard, and they, uh, we have an excellent piano player, and all we need is a good song leader. We'd have it made. We're going to take our text from Malachi, the third chapter, and uh, the question is not when we hear what Christ has done for us, how good it is, how glorious it is. It is what we do after we hear it. And so that's what the question is about, is he worthy? Is he worthy? And I want to read beginning in verse 13 of the third chapter of Malachi. And uh, it says, Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, What have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, It is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and had thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. I think it's necessary to not only understand what we read in God's word, but then to think about what does it implicate for me and what is a message for me. There are two different thought processes found all the way through the Bible about God and about God's word and they begin in the book of Genesis and that is God said to Adam and Eve that thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die the other thought process that was introduced from we know who the devil that when the tree was looked at it was good for food it was a tree to be desired it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. So those two thought processes about God and about God's word have come down all the way to us. They are with us in our day and time. So um, it's up to us as to whether we choose to honor what we're capable of being able to recognize as being true or whether we don't. We read in the 14th and 15th verse about those that say it's vain to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness are set up, yea, they that are tempt God are even delivered. Now we know there's a lot of people riding on that train, but I believe deep down if any of us really knew that that was true, that it is vain to serve God, and that it's no value whatsoever to serve God, none of us would be here. We wouldn't be here if we really believed that deep down. So when we come face to face with mortality, and of course all of us are going to have to face that eventually, where do our thoughts go? Do our thoughts go, oh, it's vain to serve God? What profit is it? No, our thoughts go, we need God. We want God to help us. We want God to comfort us. So our thoughts go to what we read in verse 16. Those that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and had thought upon his name. You know, you can take a person that's very much involved in everything and has no time for God, but when death comes, it changes the dynamics of everything. The title of our cantata, Is He Worthy? It catches our attention. I know when I first saw it on the songbook, I thought, what? Is this questioning whether he is worthy or not? And it's not, not that at all. It's rather questioning whether we have really accepted in our heart and turned to God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and all of our soul in realization he is worthy. It's a question for us. 
So it's a proper question. We will all have to answer it eventually. In Revelation chapter 4 and there in verse 11, uh, we read about the worthiness, and we're not going to try to prove, but we're just going to touch base with uh, some of the things that the Bible says about the worthiness of Christ. In Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Did you know that Jesus of the Bible is the Creator? Evolution does not fit with the Jesus of the Bible. Somewhere along the line, a person is going to have to choose whether we believe in the Jesus of the Bible or whether we believe that which denies the word of God. Hebrews 11.3, it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. No evolution. Evolution is a lie. It's a denial of God. Jesus is worthy because he created all things, and that includes you and me. And so we wouldn't exist without him. We wouldn't be here. In the fifth chapter of Revelation, in verse 12, it says, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And back in verse 9, they sung a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. He's worthy because... He provided redemption for us. And without that redemption, we would have no hope whatsoever. We would just be born a sinner, die without hope as a sinner. There is no self-redemption. Um, you have to go outside the Bible to come up with that. Because the Bible tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So the idea that in a person's lifetime they can make up for the bad they've done, you might do that circumstantially, but you don't do it for the soul. You know, just one sin brought condemnation in the Garden of Eden. And it wasn't a sin of murder. It wasn't a sin of robbing a bank. It was a sin of disobedience to God's word. Thou shalt not eat of this fruit. And that brought condemnation. So redemption was even planned before God created the world. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, it tells us we're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And it was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So what does that mean to you and me? Before we were ever born, God already had made provision to redeem us from our sins. Before we were born, God made that provision. Person ought to think about that a little bit and think about what went into that. So it's not a question of can our sins be atoned for. Sometimes people say, well, preacher, I fought in the war. I killed somebody. Well, <clears throat> in the war, it's shoot or be shot. You don't have a lot of choices there. But when it comes to sin, Christ's blood atoned for all of it. And... It is that which means that there is no sin that has not been atoned for. All sin has been atoned for. And so the question then is not, can my sins be forgiven? Is there atonement for them? But will I accept the one that made that atonement? You see, we have to accept him before his atonement is applied to us not just believing on him in a knowledge way, the head, but uh, it's a heart matter. It's a heart matter where that an individual would truly come to God as a sinner, not saying, Lord, I'm good, and I think I'm as good as the next guy, so if anybody goes to heaven, I think I should. There is none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God, and so there is none um, that is worthy of this redemption. And that's why it's grace that has 
uh, provided that salvation, unmerited favor. And when we truly come to the Lord wanting God to save us from our sin and receive Christ, that's when God will save us. But I want to just uh, say this. There's a lot of things that can get in the way of a person accepting Christ. And in Romans chapter 3 and there in verse 9, What then are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Under sin, we're born a sinner. We don't have to do something to become a sinner. We're born a sinner in Adam. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. So under sin is the opposite of seeing and understanding uh, what the things of God are. So we can only go so far. Naturally, intellectually, we can only go so far. And so when it comes to the things of God, there is a limitation of how far we can go. And then there's another thing in verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. All of us have felt guilt at some point in another in our life. And guilt exists between us and God. Not harmony and agreement. So if you think of what the part that guilt can play in your life. Say you have someone that you care deeply about, but you're guilty of doing something against that person. That becomes an obstacle between you and that person. It will show itself in every way. So guilt means that we have committed the, our thoughts and our deeds and our, our decisions under these things. We're okay with what God is not okay with. Being sinners, we are okay with what God is not okay with. And that's our guilt. And then in verse 23... All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that means no matter what our thoughts are, they still are incomplete. And they still uh, are in the state that we don't see the practicality of God's ways. And we come up short. In Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, it says, Our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Our ways are not God's ways. You know, this really impacted me this past week. And to think, my thoughts are not God's thoughts. And I mentioned this Wednesday night to our people here. What are your thoughts right now? They're not God's. They're not God's. So that is a factor that we have to deal with. God fully understands that. God fully understands it. And that's the reason that he sent Christ to save us. So 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, A natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. According to the Bible, we naturally are born sinners. We do not, um, uh, we're just don't, we're not capable of seeing the reason the purpose and the value, and certainly not the necessity of the ways that are taught to us in the Bible. That's why people oftentimes have, well, you know, I don't understand those people. I uh, just don't understand that church. So in Malachi, the third chapter, and there where we start in verse 14, ye have said, it is vain to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? Now, this is not the saying of a person that doesn't believe in God. This is not an atheist talking. But this is a person who believes in the fact of God. Oh, yeah, I believe in God. I believe, and some people really put it down low, I believe in the man upstairs. Boy, I don't ever say that. Uh, that's really belittling to God because God is holy God is righteous so um, what it is believing in God I believe in God but 
and the but. I believe in God, but. So the but will allow us to talk of God's love, God's goodness, God's kindness, God's heaven, the birth of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It'll allow us to talk about all the dessert items of the Bible. Our knowledge of God will allow us to do that, but there's a but, the but. And so we can believe in God without believing it is profitable for us to keep his ordinances. You know, when Paul talked to Felix and Agrippa, both of these gentlemen were rulers in the Roman government, and he talked to them about the Lord in Acts chapter 24 and Acts chapter 26, I believe it is. Both of them came to the same point. Felix trembled, and he said, some more convenient season I'll call for you. Agrippa said, almost you persuaded me to be a Christian. You know what was going on? The things we're talking about. They believed in God, but, and the but was, if we get saved, we'll be persecuted like these other Christians are being persecuted. It'll be the end of our political career, and so on and so on and so on. And you know, I've never found a lost person yet that didn't have a butt. I had it before I was saved. I was nine years old, almost ten, before I accepted Christ. I'd been taken to church. I knew how to be saved. If someone was to read me the plan of salvation and say, do you believe that? I'd say, yeah. Well, you're saved then. No, I wasn't. Because I hadn't repented. I had not truly turned in my heart to God. There was the butts. And there was, you know... I just didn't really like to go to church. I didn't really like to think the idea that as a Christian, people would expect me to live a certain way. I didn't like that. And I wanted to be me. But you know, one day I realized I had no hope. And that changed. That sort of raced the butts. And I had a change of mind and started opening up my heart to God. So rather than thinking it to be worthy to serve God... There can arise all the circumstantial objections and feelings and desires that are contrary to it to where a person will dismiss God's will and way as being profitable for them. In other words, he's not really worthy. He's not really worthy. So the need is reconciliation. Reconciliation with God. And that's why God commands repentance in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. God commands all men everywhere to repent. So that, that comes by way of conviction that I can't be right if I'm on the opposite side of God. I can't be right if my thoughts are not God's thoughts, if my ways are not God's ways. I can't be right. So I have a change of mind about that. And I turn to God, realizing I need something. I need salvation. And in John chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, As many as receive Christ, to them God gives a power to become his son. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. And in John 3, 3, Christ said, Ye must be born again. And that being born again is just as real as a physical birth. It's a spiritual birth. It's when a person truly accepts the Lord as their Savior and God gives to them an inner, an inner new life, an inner new life. They still are what they are, but they receive something in addition to what they are, and that is a consciousness of God, a life with God, an awareness of God, <coughs> And a realization he is worthy. And he died for my salvation. And he died that I might live unto him. So we need salvation from our guilt. As well as to be born again. To see the glory of God and his righteousness. God says in Titus 3.5. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. God saves by his power, he makes a new creature, and he imparts a spiritual life 
that realizes God is worthy. Now we can see God in all of his fullness. But apart from being born again, naturally we don't see the kingdom of God. Intellectually we have knowledge of it, but we just don't see it. And I know this is something everybody should really be concerned about. Sometimes you'll run in, into people and they'll, you ask them, do you believe on Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes. You talk to them, they know the plan of salvation, but there is still not that connection between them and God. And you know where it begins? It goes back to the fact they have never repented. They have never really turned from self and sin unto God and let him be their Savior and Lord of their life. It has to be through repentance and faith that we accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Before I was saved, I got the idea that it's not profitable to serve God. I got the idea that I didn't want to serve God. But you know, when I accepted Christ as my Savior, I also got the idea that he is my Lord. He is my Lord. He is my Savior, and he is worthy. And that's because he lives within. Paul talked about his service to the Lord, and he said it's because Christ lives within in Galatians chapter 3 and there in verse 22. So salvation is the only solution for any of us. All of us need to be saved. And when God does the saving, our salvation will be what God says it is. It's not going to be a dead horse. It's not just going to be a name on a baptismal certificate or a name on a church roll. It's going to be he lives within. He lives within. And I don't say that to be smart this morning, but I say it, he lives, and he lives within the heart of all who have accepted him. Don't miss that. Don't just let it go with a little bit of knowledge that I believe in Christ and I believe in God and and, you know, I want to live a good life and all of that. But examine yourself, like the Bible says, whether Christ be in you. Because that's what it is to be saved. Christ in you. So, in your heart and mind, in your life, where you are right now, is he worthy? Is he worthy? If you're saved this morning, the life that you're now living, the choices you're making... The things that you're doing, is it because he's worthy? You know, we all need to think about this. This isn't me. This is about you and God. This is about us and God. Do you need to turn to him and receive him with all of your heart? You know, we closed out our Sunday school lesson this morning. We're dealing with Moses and the call that God gave him. And everything that God tells us in his word, it sounds so good, it sounds so easy. And at that point, it's just like childlike faith receiving it. But it's what happens afterwards. And sometimes it's what happens afterwards that gets in our way. We just don't surrender all the way to God. May we bow our heads for prayer. Father, as we come to you this morning, we know all of us need to ask ourselves the question, is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is his worthiness what is defining my thoughts, my desires, my will, my decisions in life? We know it should be, and we know it can be, but yet we realize there are so many things, so many objections, and we know the source of them. They come from our sinful nature, they come from what we are in the flesh. And these are things that should testify to us of how much we need your grace and your delivering power. Even after we're saved, we cannot walk by sight. We must walk by faith. We must have Jesus Christ delivering us every day in the lives we live. So we pray that you'll bless thy word this morning. Bless the songs, the messages of them to the hearts of these people. And we just pray that we would truly, truly, really leave the house of God knowing that he is worthy. And we ask now that your Holy Spirit would give the invitation for us in Jesus' name. We all